I'm here with Thane Rosenbaum. Uh, Thane is a, a professor at Turo College. He is a writer, a novelist. Um, he writes frequently for the Jewish Journal. He uh, wrote a great piece very recently on um, the decline of Jewish culture in the face of woke ideology. And uh, it, was, it was such a powerful piece. And um, I also heard him interviewed about it. And I thought we have to have him on the speech cast. And of course, we're familiar with you, Thane. You've been writing about these issues for a while. In fact, we have you, we have a little video clip uh, that's going to uh, soon be out of you talking about the problem of critical social justice ideology and anti-Semitism. We'll talk about that as well. But um, I usually start off these podcasts asking my guests, what do you make of the current ideological moment? But I'm going to expand the question to, what do you make of the current ideological and cultural moment right now? Well, ideologically, um, I'm just surprised at how willing we are to abandon America's liberal culture without a fight, uh, with literally without people you know, pounding on the desks that this is not American. Uh, for us to be shouting down people, for, for rejecting free speech, for respecting the openness of inquiry and ideas, uh, the basic concept of, of fundamental fairness and, and, and individual merit. You know, the, the world in which we live now is illiberal in every single phase. If you define what the you know, enlightened philosophers of the 18th century uh, set upon us that we eventually built an American constitution and a French constitution. You know, we're all sort of cousins of the same liberal ideas. And we have, I think, for, forgotten them, or I, I think it's worse than that. It's been a cynical attempt to pretend that progressivism is liberalism when it's not. The progressive culture in which we live is anti-liberal in every phase. So uh, what I would answer is, to your question is I'm just surprised at how illiberal we have become, uh, how confused we are about what it means to be left wing. You know, what is it what it used to be to mean left wing was that there was a real sense of creative imagination and intellectual energy and the ability to make distinctions between right and wrong and the process of deliberation, right? This business of canceling people, uh, canceling, I've said this before, canceling is not Jewish and it's not American. It's just not, it's anti-American. We don't cancel, we believe in public squares where people get up on soapboxes and give speeches and people invade, engage in robust, respectful debate. It can be passionate, but then the public is asked to go home and to deliberate on what they just heard on soapboxes. That's not what we have today. Today, you are banished from Shabbat dinners unless you agree with everything I said, because only my truth matters. And I have a narrative that I follow because I haven't, you know, these are people that for the most part haven't read books. They don't know anything. They're just repeating a narrative. <laughs> So I would say two things. One is, you know, the ideological moment is one that is, is fundamentally, avowedly a liberal. And the cultural moment is one that is only a recipe for mediocrity. It is not, it is not. Equity is, is you know, uh, is the next step before mediocrity and derivative art. Uh, you know, intellectual energy, creative imagination uh, for, requires the artist and cultural figures to, to be free to imagine and observe widely, you know, uh, instead of a culture uh, where we're having sort of an oxygen debt now, where we're sucking the life out of the culture, that we're literally telling people, you can't uh, reimagine another person, you can't represent another culture. Uh, everything you do, if you, if it could be considered uh, appropriation, stealing of another culture, as you pointed out, David, I'm a novelist. You know, it essentially puts me out of business. It says I can only speak, I can only imagine someone just like me. And if it happens to be, I have a new novel that I'm not finished yet, I'm afraid to finish because it's set in Harlem. And I know 
and the, there are African American characters, and I know that it'll be, you know, it'll be completely denounced. Who is Thane Rosenbaum? By the way, I lived for Har in Harlem for 12 years, uh, and Harlem, by the way, also used to be a Jewish neighborhood uh, during the Harlem Renaissance. Jews, I think, were still the primary uh, population in Harlem. I think I could be wrong. Um, um, the, 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 the church that I lived across for 12 years, David, in Harlem had a star of David on the front. It was originally a synagogue on 120th and Lenox. Just to, as I used to stare out, I used to stare out at a church that had a star of David. So that would be my answer that, that in both cases, ideologically and culturally, this is a very dark moment. So let's play this out, your novel, for a second. Uh, you know, there are critics of the idea of cancel culture who pretty much deny that it exists or think it exists only on the margins and we're making too big of a deal of it. So let's say you go forward with this novel, and in that novel, there are some African American characters, and there are certain people who start challenging your standing to uh, represent those characters. What will really happen to you that gives you pause? What are you afraid might might happen? Well, that it wouldn't be read on its own terms, right? That's what an artist wants. You know, even when a book is reviewed, the book review is not for the book reviewer to tell you the book he or she would have written. That's not a good book review. Uh, and if you're an editor, you should reject a book review from someone who sends in a review that says, this is not the book that I would have written, <laughs> as opposed to you take the book on its own terms. So. I, what I am concerned is that the book couldn't be accepted. The novel can't be accepted on its own terms. And what are those terms? Well, it's an imaginative work of art. Uh, it's set in Harlem. Naturally, it has African-American characters. And they speak. And a white guy from Manhattan actually uh, can has the ability, to, living in this city, to know the cadence and, and, and rhythm of, of what an African-American sounds like. It doesn't, it doesn't sound like a Yiddish accent, right? That you give respect to the fact that there is the capacity to reimagine in a way that you judge a novel that way. Oftentimes a novel can be criticized when you say all the characters sound alike or that they speak the same, right? I mean, that's a very legitimate criticism of a novel. But what I'm concerned about is the characters that I've created the fact that they're speaking in a dialect or in a syntax or with the cadence or rhythm of my understanding of an African-American, my ear of how African-Americans spoke in Harlem, that itself will be considered a appropriation, misappropriation. Uh, it also talks about Af not just African-American culture, but it also deals with uh, Amer American politics and the relationship between blacks and Jews. There will be people that will say, you have no right to give to, to write a novel in which you are offering the black perspective. How do you know? You're a white Jewish person. So these are the kinds of criticisms. Well, David, it's, there's no, nothing's going to stop me from publishing it. I'm just Good. saying I don't feel rushed to publish it now because I think this is the worst possible moment uh, to enter into it. I can tell you this. Most people in my position, if I published the novel, would immediately apologize on Twitter and apologize to the African-American community for appropriating. I, I will not apologize. I'm telling you right now. You will, you, right. No one will hear an apology from me to anybody uh, for, because I don't owe anybody an apology. What we've seen in the last five years is disgraceful. People spending all their time on Twitter apologizing for a Halloween costume they wore five years ago, right? Or, or for just saying something that could be misinterpreted as something else. Uh, and literally apologizing with the kind of self-abasement that is so undignified uh, that I would tell my children, please don't ever make those kinds of apologies because you look ridiculous. You look like you have no spine, that you have no sense of, of moral virtue or purpose in life that you're, you are been reduced to this, you know, this, this week, this week of position of, of, of uncertainty about what you say and do. Hmm. So this idea that only the affected community or only someone from the affected community has the right to share their experience um, comes out of this 
standpoint epistemology or standpoint theory. It's this idea that it's only our lived experience that counts. And um, yet sometimes I hear it in the Jewish community too. We say only Jews have the right to define anti-Semitism. And that's basically saying only our lived experience with anti-Semitism gives us the right to articulate for the society. So it seems like we're also trying to use the same sort of social justice lexicon in a way that serves us, even if we're critical when it when it's applied against us. Is that some is that a critique that you share? Am I am I wrong about that? Sometimes we do the same. No, I mean I look, I don't I think it's fine for African Americans to define what they see as racism. And I think you can have a conversation about what the limits, what are the boundaries of that, right? What we know today is that almost anything you say, if anyone disagrees with you and you're white, you're a racist, which means something I've written about before. If everyone is a racist, then no one's a racist. So this, right. this is a big mistake, African-Americans. Stop calling people a racist. Um, because really, it's like it's as if you can't make distinctions between the Klan and someone who had a tweet when they were 16 years old. Um, but I actually think that there's nothing wrong with Jews defining within reason their understanding of, of, of anti-Semitism. But l- let me just say, you don't see Jews saying, ban all productions of the Merchant of Venice. Uh, you, you don't see Jews saying, you can't teach T.S. Eliot or Ezra Pound or I'm trying to think of other, you know, writers, you know, uh, uh, certainly uh, Voltaire, trying to think of the numbers of uh, writers who have a long history of anti-Semitism. I think uh, Theodore Dreiser, there were some questions about Dreiser as well. I, 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 I don't know any Jews that say that those writers need to be banned because of, you know, in the same way. That What I'm saying is that stu- Jews are not the ones unless they're doing it in a Black Lives Matter protest, p- knocking down statues, right? This idea of erasing from our lives the context of certainly artists that made art at a certain period of time, you know, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington. George Washington was opposed to slavery. He owned slaves. You know, he was also the founding father of this country. There was, you know, in those days, people owned slaves. There were obviously along the road to freedom, there were people that knew it was wrong. You know who else knew it was wrong? Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration of Independence and said all men are created equal and he owned slaves, right? So so are we supposed to ban the Declaration of Independence because it was written by someone who owned slaves? So I'm saying I, it is true that, you know, you can take, you could do this with Jews as well, but Jews don't do this. To my knowledge, Jews have not said we ban everyone who's ever been in said or done anything, and we and and we refuse to accept the possibility that a person who's not Jewish couldn't write a Jewish character. Um, you know, uh, uh, William Styron wrote Confessions of Nat Turner. Uh, he also mm-hmm. wrote Sophie's Choice, although Sophie wasn't Jewish. Uh, you know, a Southern writer uh, attempted to take uh, a novel into Auschwitz. Uh, there were questions about that that were moral questions, but they weren't about that a Southern writer didn't have the right to reimagine as if to say only Holocaust victims could reimagine the, a Jewish genocide. Hmm. So you you have a very specific concern about what this will do to Jewish culture. What, what, are, what are your concerns about how this will affect Jewish culture? Well, I have a, a more, more a larger concern. It's the way it's affecting American culture by stifling Jews. Uh, One of the things I say in this article, uh, in this essay, and I've written this before, if you let Jews be Jews, you get good things come out of it. You get inventions, you get plays, films, art, music, you get a lot. Let Jews be Jews. This happened in the Enlightenment. Rembrandt's biggest supporters were Jews. This is a long history. In this country, American culture, I'm sorry, it's Jewish culture. We, we American Jews have dominated in their contribution uh, to Jewish culture. And I mentioned, I, you know, list some of those examples, um, you know, and, you know, I mean, here's a really good one from, you know, American music, the entire American song, songbook from Tin Pan Alley to Ragtime to the Brill Building to Rock and Roll, 
you know, you Jews have always been, you know, at the forefront. So one of the concerns that I have is that the kind of um, uh, uh, denunciations in our culture, uh, the, the new rules of cultural limitation, um, the art that now, you know, has to somehow emanate, emanate from grievance and reprimand instead of open-mindedness and creative imagination doesn't produce art, it produces mediocrity. So one concern I have is that for all of us, we are going to be, we're heading into an era of cultural decline. You, if this continues, if the woke culture, intersectionality, 1619 project, they're all the same, Black Lives Matter. If we continue along this path, we will have an, a, a deficiency uh, uh, and, 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 and also a, a, de a, a declining quality of American culture. Uh, Jews didn't just create culture for Jews. Uh, the Hollywood studios, four of the six Hollywood studios that moved from Astoria, Queens to Los Angeles were run by Jews. Uh, uh, the four of the six, think about that. Most of those movies were cowboy westerns, good guy versus bad guy. None of those Jews had ever been on a horse, right? They were obviously, they weren't making art only for Jews. They were making art for America, right? You know, Le you know Levi Strauss didn't go to San Francisco to make pants for Jews. He made jeans for people that were prospecting. So, you know, Jews were not trying to just cultivate their own culture. They looked inward and picked up their own, you know, the, 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 the Jewish sensibility, its wryness, its wit, its irreverence, uh, its puckishness, its self-deprecation, everything that is Jewish and found ways to express it in the broader culture. So my first concern is that American culture is gonna be in decline because all of us are now being hamstrung in this suffocation of wokeness. But Jews especially, I think, are going to be disoriented because they believe that one of the things that America allowed them to be is to be Jewish and to be Jewish and to express themselves, not just for Jews, but express themselves with the Jewish sensibility that has been such a mainstay in the production of American art. So I'm writing an article um, then I think I'm going to call something like in praise of de uh, Jewish debate culture. Yes. And it always um, hit me that um, I grew up in a sort of unique way, um, not, not unique perhaps for many Jews, but perhaps unique in the larger scheme of things in the U.S. Um, Coleman Hughes, the uh, young black intellectual, talked about growing up in a Jewish area and how he would be in a dinner table with Jews and find that they were quite disputatious and argumentative. And that was a learning experience for him to see how they function. Um, and, you know, that's exactly how I grew up. I mean, mostly with Jewish boys who, and we, we would argue all the time um, into the night about every subject imaginable. And then you go out into the, to the rest of the world and you find that sometimes that doesn't work very well, that people don't find that uh, disputation is quite as charming as you might, you know, you might in the, uh, in the, in the hood. Um, what, do you have, first of all, is that, is that your, would you characterize uh, Jewish debate culture in that way? How was your experience growing up with that? How, how have you lived that out in your own, your own life? Well, I'm no Talmud scholar, David. I'm no Talmud scholar, but the Talmud is one long disagreement. You right. know, this, this is, you know, the Jewish, you know, debating culture, you know, argumentative discussions is uh, fundamentally Jewish, right? And, and the, 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 the capacity, again, the willingness to disagree without banishment and exile is a very Jewish conceit. And that's something that's, you know, again, you, you only today surround yourself with the same people who think exactly like you do. The cable news shows, you know, when I was growing up, you know, we didn't know uh, in CBS News what, whether Walter Cronkite was a Democrat or a Republican. We didn't care, right? But today we're, we're so balkanized in our silos that we only watch the news that gives us the news we want. And the news pr producers know that. They give us that. So we're again, we're living in a, a culture 
that has rejected the entire concept, again, of liberalism, which accepts disagreement on, on its, again, on its own terms, the ability to disagree, the ability to make uh, distinctions, fundamental distinctions between uh, right and wrong, the, uh, the capacity uh, to sit with uncertainty, right? To just, you know, to sit with the recognition, I don't know, I'm not sure, I've got to give this more thought. Nobody talks like that anymore. They're too busy telling people to shut up and don't say that because you're a terrible person. Now, it's not so much I disagree with you, it's that you're morally beyond the pale and you need to leave. That's the world we're in now. And I'll say it again, that world is not Jewish. So if people have been doing that to you at Shabbat dinners, they don't understand what a Shabbat dinner is for. That's just, there's not something fundamentally not Jewish about not accepting someone else's opinion without banishing them from every source of life and human connection. Um, so yes, uh, the way you grew up was the way I grew up. Uh, you know, uh, all bets were off. Uh, people, were fr people were free thinkers. People knew that others were free thinkers. They, they suspected what someone felt about something and it didn't get them disinvited from a bar mitzvah because of it. And today mm. that has changed. Again, it's changed for Jews, which I think is especially tragic because I think Jews, I think in that way did, they certainly you know, made a contribution to American culture that without them would have been you know, Presbyterian, Episcopalian and Protestant where you know, there would have been a lot more silence at the dinner table. Yeah. So yes, having the, you know, the ability and the willing, willingness to get into a conversation that includes, entails argument, that's part of the problem today. That, that what I said before about the, <clears throat> the rejection of liberalism. Liberalism mm -hmm. assumes that people will disagree and that they will come from different point of views and that you will let pe you'll give people a hearing respectfully and that you will either accept or reject what they have to say without rejecting them as a human being. That's different. And that is, right. again, not Jewish and it's not American. Hmm. You know, one of the things that has struck me in this sort of uh, lurch toward wokeness is the change in the term white supremacy. Um, white supremacy used to mean a bunch of guys with tiki torchers and um, white hat, you know, hats marching around saying Jews will not replace us. And now it's being used to mean the sort of fundamental dominant culture of America is white supremacists. The very fact that there is a culture that might be different from, let's say, Latino culture or black culture, there's a dominant culture. And that dominant culture as currency is now being termed white supremacy. And I, I find it somewhat ironic that the, uh, that the, the woke crowd is trying to stifle Jewish culture in a way, and they're actually using sort of a a, dom, a, a dominant cultural modality to do it. I mean, they're, they're, they're using their own definition of, of white supremacy to say that we shouldn't debate when that's not my culture. My culture allows us to debate and think things through and to be, to, uh, to experiment and so forth. Um, so, you know, have, have you, are, are you, have you are you wa sort of um, watching closely the the way that these ter terms are being used? What, what's your take on all that? They're da they're dangerous, David. I mean, I, I'll say this: it, there's never been a better time to be a Klansman in the United States. If you want to be the Klan, today's the time. You know why? Because you will be treated no differently than any other white person. There will be no distinction between you and a person who is fundamentally liberal fundamentally in favor of civil rights and human rights. But if you happen to disagree on a point that a person of color <laughs> believes is a point that is important to the, their, the recognition of their identity, you are immediately a white supremacist, right? Without, there's no other, there's no other redeeming thing that can be said about you. If you, if you, if you don't immediately accept the protocols of intersectionality, in all its manifestations, you are taking a white supremacist position as opposed to what you're saying. No, no, I'm not a, I'm not a racist, I'm not a white supremacist. 
I just don't disagree with that and I'm willing to hear you out, right? But what we've done today, is this is, again, it's a, it's a culture of, of resentment and denunciation and grievance. That's the politics of identity, right? It's about resentment, grievance and denunciation. And so unless that's why you're seeing such fear, fear in corporate America, you know, fear in human resources departments, you know, in, in businesses, fear because the, the ease with which a person can be called a racist and the speed with which the, an employer will think that they have to fire you. You know, I'm, I'm was shocked that what you saw at Simon and Schuster and Hachette Books and at the New York Times and even Major League Baseball, shocked, you know, that none of these entities could think for themselves. None of them. Most of them were taking orders from 24 year olds who just graduated high school. Yeah, why? Why? Why do you? What do you think is behind this cowardly impulse? I, people know, who should it, know better. Uh, yeah, right. Well, the very people that should be standing up for free speech are, are the ones that are shutting it down. Publishers, media. Uh, I think that there is now a. Uh, it's it's fashionable in our culture to be woke, to show that you have. Your, your only sensitivity is to people of color and to the racism of this country. It's the only thing. But, but, but why, are they de- why are they deferring so quickly to it? What about it makes it fashionable, I guess? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, again, I find it anti-intellectual and illiberal on its face. So I don't see what it is. Look, uh, the Internet hasn't helped. Uh, you see what we have, what do they call media influencers, social influencers, you know, models, you know, and somehow have power on, on with Twitter or Instagram. How is that possible? People that might have never read a book make it will actually make a difference in how people view the world. I just think that there is it's I hope it doesn't continue. Uh, I can't imagine the allure. Uh, a part of it is a narcissism. I felt the same way about uh, what Jews that hate Israel and openly speak of hating Israel. It feels narcissistic to me, you know, that they're saying, look at me, look at me. I'm a Jew and I hate my people. I'm disgusted by my people. Look at me, look at me, right? As if to say, look at my virtue, instead of saying, you're a self-hating Jew. That's what I'm seeing in you. So I think some of it is narcissism. There is a sense that people feel good about themselves to show that they, you know, that I'm Black Lives Matter is the only thing that matters to me. You know, people that will march with Black Lives Matter and the movement itself is anti-Semitic and would do nothing for Jews and haven't. No, I, I know of no one in Black Lives Matter movement that said a word about Jews being beaten in the streets in Los Angeles and New York and Seattle, not one word came out of Black Lives Matter. Summer ago, we saw many Jews, hundreds, thousands, marching in Black Lives Matter, you know, uh, demonstrations. I think people, those same people, if a rabbi was beaten up across the street, wouldn't cross the street. Somehow it's not interesting to them. What's interesting to them is to say, look at me, I'm a Jew, and I know how racist this country is and how disgusting it is. And you see, to me, Again, it's it just something that is just so profoundly wrong on its face. This is the greatest country in the history of the world, and it's the greatest country for Jews in the history of the Jewish people, aside from Israel, right? What this country brought Jews, for Jews to walk around and use words that suggest that they hate America, to be so unpatriotic, only to prove to people in the Black Lives Matter line how virtuous they are to me is just just so sad and so despicable because it shows again no sense of intellectual honesty no sense of proportion right no sense of proportion um you know the sense of this i saw people last summer uh you know jews whose passion about black lives matter was so beyond anything i ever saw them ever marshal on behalf of anti-Semitism against Jews in France. You know, I've been writing, you know, for years about the Jews of Europe and the Jews of France. Very few Jews have ever called and said or written to me, 
and said, yeah, you know, this. thank you for calling this to my attention. I, I'm going to be paying more attention to it now. But if you wrote anything that would have been mildly critical of Black Lives Matter, or for that matter, uh, complimentary of Donald Trump, you would be denounced. Correct. So let me, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm pushing back because I largely agree with you. You know, I've spent most of my career up until recently in what's called the community relations field, where we're yeah. building bridges to other ethnic and religious communities. Um, and at one point in time, I would have argued that, well, yes, it is true that there's um, a lot of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism in these progressive circles. We want the Jewish community to be able to be at these marches and rallies and show up as Jews um, and, um, and do so so that they can ultimately exercise some influence at these tables. And there are some examples of that happening. I mean, you can be critical of the Women's March, but there were Jewish women who were involved with it, who, event, who, who prevented Linda Sarsour from using it as a platform for anti-Zionism. Uh, which would have done if that But David, they left. They left once they were accused of being part of a group that financed the slave trade. The Jewish founders of the Black uh, of Jewish of the Women's March were essentially pushed out by Linda Sarsour and Tamika Mallory. Right. It was, it was it was more it was more complex. There, yes, that was true among some, but there were groups like National Council of Jewish Women. Who, uh, who continued to engage the leaders of the Women's March movement and were able to prevent it from going off the deep end. And, I, and I, look, I think that there's a huge cost in that. And the cost is that we're, even if we succeed sometimes in doing that, we're giving supper to a movement that is going to continue to manufacture anti-Semitism. In other words, um, you, you, you sort of have this choice of either saying, we're going to, Fight the, the ideology, the underlying ideology that gives rise to this anti-Semitism, fight it tooth and nail, uh, or we're going to accept the fact that we're not going to be able to do that effectively on our own, at least. So might as well engage the people within it and try to influence the direction and the perception of Jews within it. And, um, and now I've changed sides. I'm now on that former side that says, we've just got to fight the ideology. It's going to, it's the gift that uh, keeps on giving, and we're going to continue to play whack-a-mole with anti-Semitism as long as this ideology holds so much sway. But on the other hand, there's still part of my brain that says that should be the primary approach. But do we really want all progressive Zionists, for example, that we know to say, don't go to the Black Lives Matter march or the Women's March, or don't be involved in those movements because um, you'll give separate to those movements, you'll strengthen those movements, or do we want them there because we know that they still can have some influence and we might lose in our ability to really marginalize this ideology in the long run. But David, it, to me, it's not about giving strength to these new movements. It's about mutual respect. It's about moral standing. If, you, if Jews are not welcome in this march with these marches, these demonstrations, these movements with mutual respect for what matters also to Jews, uh, what the, the historic alignment between Jews and African Americans was based on a history of shared persecution. Well, the Black Lives Matter movement doesn't accept that. They don't recognize that there is any history of Jewish persecution. Uh, Jews are white people and they're privileged, so they have nothing to complain about. So no, I don't. I think you don't join any march unless you're treated with mutual respect and unless you're welcome in with moral standing, you know, I mean, you know, Aristotle talked about what kind of a person, you know, keeps showing up and is treated, you know, so dishonorably without, you know, dignity and mutual respect. What kind of a person does that? You know, where's your moral standing? Where is a person's moral spine if they don't show up and know that we're here united for a cause? and we are mutually respected. You know, one of the things that the United Nations did, it doesn't seem to work for Israel, but one of the things that the United Nations did in the charter, which is very important, David, is that it said all nations need to be given mutual standing and respect, right? Which means that every time Iran says we're wiping Israel off the map, this should be a, re a rebuke from the Security Council. Every time a country talks about destroying another country, that violates the charter of the United Nations. And I think that 
it's a similar principle. That but yet, yet, Israel continues to have a UN ambassador. I mean, I know that um, Ben Gurion used to say Um Shmum, in other words, United Nations Shmum. Um, but um, but the truth is that the Israelis have always engaged in the United Nations. They always send ambassadors. They have a diplomatic. But that's war. different from standing in a line on behalf of Iran, right? They don't vote for resolutions that Iran Iran supports. No, of course Black not. Lives Matter. I'm not saying that there shouldn't be. You know, for instance, when Jews were excluded from the Dyke Mark march right because also their connection right. i don't have a problem with jews being connected to progressive causes but that's different from saying we will march in something that is specifically ir- designed to call attention to this but when we come here as a group we we come here expecting your respect respecting the fact that we have moral standing to be here and that you would treat us similarly and justly with respect to issues that matter to us. And I right. think that is something that should be a, you know, a, you know, I mean, for instance, you know, this idea that I, I don't see how Jews can be joining any group that calls Israel an apartheid state, right? That they accepting this falsehood that is so demonstrably false, right? It's not an apartheid, in no way does it mirror a, a but I just think that Jews have been too casual about this, that we should be insisting we're not we're not behind you at all. If you're going to say stupid, false libels against the Jewish people, we can't ex- we cannot support anything, even though we might say privately or publicly. But for us to get blisters to walk in a march for you and with you, blisters must come with mutual respect and the respect of moral standing of equals. And that's something that Jews have not received for many years within the black community. And let me just say, Bayard Rustin, Martin Luther King would be shocked by this, absolutely shocked by the last you know, five to 10 years. So I, what do you think the Jew, I, I just started with others, a group called the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values. We are trying to fight the good fight. Do you have any thoughts on what we ought to do to try to shift this ideological culture that we find ourselves in? Holding the line on liberalism is the answer. It's one of the reasons I'm here today with you. Uh, I really respected that you started this new uh, uh, enterprise. Everything about, when I read the about page, everything in the about page is something that was important to me. Uh, and you, you, you know, asked me to sign a letter. I signed a letter. Uh, you asked me to be part of some video. I did that. You, you, here I am. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm all in. My chips are all in here with you. And one of the reasons is because you've made a commitment professionally and emotionally to liberalism. This is how Jews have have succeeded in the Western world only through liberal culture. And what passes for progressivism today is illiberal. And the problem is that Jews seem to be supporting the progressive line. Uh, you know, Bernie Sanders has a lot to be, is responsible for a lot of this uh, in my mind, but he's not alone. Uh, and there, there, there are, there, these are stooges and they feel very narcissistic about their sense of mission and their sense of, you know, generosity and tikkun olam on behalf of, you know, the community of men and women. Uh, but they're doing two things. They're dishonoring their people, they're endangering their people, and they're creating, a, they're helping to create a, a, a whole new culture that will lead America and the Western world in the wrong direction, in a direction of autocracy and, and mediocrity and authoritarianism and a, 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 a banishing of free speech and the rule of law, it's a, we're, we're, we're heading, you know, these, in my mind, these are dark days and we're not more serious about the, what needs to happen. And what needs to happen is preservation of liberal culture. Because that's how Jews have survived the best and have contributed to best to the societies in which they've lived. Hmm. All right, well, that's a good place to end. I, <laughs> I uh, really appreciate your writing, your um, your charisma. I, I think you brought out 
the cultural dimension of this better than I've heard anybody so far. And you know, we talk about the corruption of medicine, the corruption of the academic world, uh, the corruption of science, um, the the um, the corruption of organizational culture. But this also clearly has a tremendous impact on on our culture, on art, and uh, we should all be very aware of what that is and how this will affect um, art and our sense of dynamism in, in a country that's known for its dynamism, that's, that's built on its dynamism. So um, thank you very much, Dane, and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation. Anytime for you, David, thank you. All right, be well.